Okay, so my story, part of the story that I'm going to share today is to shed light on a law that is outdated and needs changing. This law was drafted in the late 1970s and applies to nearly 100 countries, including Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the USA. This law was drafted for non-custodial parents abducting their children across borders after losing custody or when they had believed they had loosed, were going to lose custody. However, for the past couple of decades, 70% of the cases have involved mothers fleeing domestic violence to the safety of another country. This law does not recognise domestic violence. Instead, it is still considered abduction of the child no matter what. In a report written by Gina Masterton, she has interviewed 10 women who have been victims of domestic violence and victims of this law. This law is the Hague Convention. All 10 of these women felt their voice was not heard in the court or felt their domestic violence experiences were not believed and they felt they were treated like criminals. I read this report the day prior to me fleeing my abusive husband back in 2018 from Australia and returning to my birth country of New Zealand. I'd lived in Australia for 33 years of my 40 years. Australia had been my home. Because of the Hague Convention, I did not take my three-year-old son with me as it would obviously severely affect my custody battle in the future to save him. Instead, I decided to leave it in the hands of the law and what I thought at the time was the right thing to do. In my case, I already had a domestic violence order in play. It had even been extended from three years to five years as he breached it twice within the first three months. And everything else I read the day before I left in regards to custody battles, all laws and the red tape that had to be followed with no exemptions, except where domestic violence was a concern. So my belief at the time was I'd get custody of my son quickly and I would only be a short time away from him. And I was wrong. It is now going on two and a half years with no end court date yet in sight. I've had to prove domestic violence was my reason for fleeing. I've had to prove my sanity and capabilities in raising a child. I've been asked no less than three times in the same hour interview with a doctor for my son's lawyer if I'd ever been removed by the police or ambulance and taken to a mental institution, just because I suffered depression during my marriage. I'd been accused of being a bad mother and a flight risk, that if even if I was investigated today, my daughter, who from my first marriage is nearly 12 and lives with me, should be removed from my care. I've been denied legal aid, and even one of the reasons behind it was stating there was no domestic violence even with a police-appointed domestic violence order on my abuser. I've had to go through all the red tape and procedures as if there was no domestic violence. I could not get exemption from mediation, which held up the court process by eight months. It was eight months of waiting for a phone discussion, which I knew would lead nowhere. There was no reasoning or negotiating with a narcissistic abusive man. An article written by Rachel Olding on April 17, 2016, states an abusive father was awarded custody because the judge believed the mother would turn a 10 year old son against his father. A trend that is appearing in the courts where the parent who supposedly alienates the other parent is seen to be worse than the abusive parent. In my first court case, I was able to provide evidence of my son's father alienating me from my son's life. I provided messages to the court where I had been denied communication with my son, being told that I only had access to talk to my son on Mother's Day and my birthday, as these were the special days. But other than that, I will not be able to talk to him. And he won custody at this stage because I'd been out of my son's life for a year. So my alienation instead went against me, not the alienating abusive parent as per previous times. I've tried filing a contradiction order on my abuser, proving that he's not following court appointed communication time with my son. Even stating three days after the judge handed down the order of every second day of communication with my son, my abuser wrote in a message, every second day puts out our routine, Monday and Wednesday and Friday is more than enough. And the order was not even accepted into the court system. As I'm wanting my son to live with me in New Zealand, my custody battle was moved from the federal courts to the family courts, which was another delay. A family court judge ordered we conduct mediation again before a court date is set as domestic violence has still yet to be determined. Another delay that only granted me communication time on Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sunday and allowing me to have one week with my son here at Christmas, which obviously with COVID it's not going to happen. And there's still no, being, no date set for an end of this court battle. 
So even after all these are court appointed communications, it all still lays in the control of my abuser and I now hardly get to talk to my son at all. My calls go unanswered or I get messages that my son doesn't want to talk to me. And in these last weeks, if he does call, it's to tell me he doesn't want to talk to me today. According to the law, the only reasonable excuse to not follow court orders is one, if they believe they had to protect somebody's health and safety, or two, it continued longer than necessary, and three, they didn't understand it was a breach at the time. It is also mentioned that the main care of the child must encourage a relationship with the child and the other parent. His father has proven time and time again that he does not encourage a relationship. He has told my son if he doesn't want to talk, he doesn't have to. I've even had my son tell me, Daddy told me he'll give me a prize if I don't talk to you tonight. And I've also been told, Dad said he'll say yes to everything I ask if I don't talk to you tonight. So it's from this little mummy's boy who wanted in my arms all the time. He wanted on my lap to watch TV, to go everywhere with me if I left the house. He would cry and perform when he was removed from my lap and made to sit on his dad's lap. And then he was threatened with a smack if he didn't calm down. Now, when I say to his father that he needs to encourage my son to talk to me so we can keep having this relationship, he instead tells me it's child abuse to make a child do something he doesn't want to do. So my sweet little boy, who has now been turned against me, has been told lies of why I left. Shortly after my first court date, where I had to return to Australia, and I spent five beautiful days with my son, where our bond was like I was never out of his life. In a call with him after, he asked why I was not home yet. And then he asked me, was it because I took all dad's money? He then went and got in his money box and offered me his money to come back home. So a parent who is not only the abuser, but is also alienating the other parent, according to the law, should not get custody, but here he has. A law written by man and clearly for man. I share my story on this part due to the injustice of the law that is supposed to protect. A law that is supposed to do the right thing. Where money gets thrown by the government left, right and centre into the battle to fight domestic and family violence. But goes no further when it comes to the court system and battles for child custody due to this domestic violence. I share my story for the mothers who have faced the same lack of support and have also lost their children to their abusive fathers. Where what seems a ruling in court is only good for a father, as if the same things happen to its mother, it's not taken into account. Again, a system that is written by man and for man. A system that is outdated, is destroying children's lives and mother's lives in the defense of the abusive father. I've been going through all this deflating and heartbreaking battle for custody of my son for over two years now. Yet even during all this, I've managed to come off 10 years of antidepressants within seven months after I fled. I've turned my experience with domestic violence, depression, anxiety, and PTSD into a positive. During my eight years, I've undertaken many holistic training and courses, and I've had my disposable all the tools necessary that enabled me to change my life around. Because of what I know due to my experience of being in the system within a woman's refuge safe housing and the mental results of being in an abusive relationship, I know the hurdles that are needed to overcome and I know where there is a lacking in support. Because of this, I'm wanting to fill that gap. I'm creating a course to help women with the first moment they leave and to hopefully make sure they don't become a statistic of returning to their abuser again. A course I'm wanting to be made available and taught in all women's centres and women's refuges and also online. Everything I did that allowed me to come off my medication, build another life from scratch, another business, take my life back and be here today to share my story. With these daily tools, I'm able to still go through all that I go through and the frustration with the one-sided system, the lack of support with the legal system in Australia the lack of communication with my little boy and not being in his life and still the abusive messages from his father. And even though I have my tearful moments, I'm still able to bounce back, determined, strong and ready to continue to battle for my son and to make a difference in the lives of women who have gone through and are going through what I have. For as with the sharing of the stories, 
the awareness of what is happening and the holding arms of many that where we can finally make a difference in a system that makes victims of domestic abuse victims of the court system also.